Hello and welcome to this uh, IFOL and Coalition S webinar on rights retention. Uh, it's uh, a topic that uh, has been very important for IFOL for, for many years, and we all know that uh, it's uh, quite a complicated topic to communicate to researchers and uh, policymakers. Uh, so we're really glad that uh, Coalition S uh, launched uh, rights retention strategy and also this year launched uh, a campaign to help uh, researchers uh, understand better. So this webinar is really about uh, Coalition S uh, rights retention strategy and uh, resources or uh, support materials they have. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Johan Rurik and Sally Ramsey with us today and they'll be speaking, they'll be sharing uh, where, where they are now with the strategy and uh, please use this opportunity to ask questions if you have any and hope after today's webinar we could think of uh, some institutional or national strategies to advance rights retention. So thanks again and uh, over to you Johan and Sally. Uh, thank you, Irina, for um, inviting us. Uh, we're glad to speak to the rights retention uh, strategy because we think it's very important and we will also talk about the way in which institutions can uh, uh, adopt the rights retention strategy, which I think is becoming more and more vital for its success. Uh, let me share my screen and we will start in presentation mode. Um, so. I will first talk a little bit about Coalition S and Plan S, and then we will launch into the rights retention strategy immediately. Um, Coalition S is 27 organizations world worldwide. We just had Switzerland join this morning, which is a very happy occasion. Uh, European Commission, of course, is part of Horizon Europe, charitable foundations like Wellcome Trust, William and the Gates Foundation, uh, uh, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute, but also we have a global dimension with the World Health Organization on board, uh, Jordan, Zambia, and South Africa. And also, we have to know that Coalition S, as a, on the whole, spends or invests about 35 billion euros uh, uh, annually in research fund with an output of about 150,000 articles per, per year. So to give you an idea of the scope of the, the, the organization. Uh, Planners itself is not a policy. It's very important to know that. It's a set of principles, a set of principles with guidance on implementation. And that implementation, of course, it takes the shape of, of various policies. Um, so these 10 principles that we that were formulated in 2018 have now found their uh, implementation in, set, in, a, in a number of in a number of policies which you can find on online. Um, Plan S uh, uh, has actually uh, one single goal, namely make sure that all publications that are funded by public funds or private grants of these organizations are published in full and immediate open access or made of available to open access repositories. But the, 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 the important thing is no embargo and immediate open access, no more waiting periods and immediate open access with a CC by license. So basically the idea is if you are funded by a coalition as funder, then all of your peer reviewed papers must be immediate open access with a CC by license, irrespective of the color of your open access, whether it's gold, diamond, or green, we don't care. It has to be open access. And that is that is the bottom line. Um, I will now hand over to Sally for a copy for the part on copyrights and licensing, because this is something that is very crucial to the rights retention strategy. Sally? Thank you, Johan. There are three routes to compliance uh, with the Plan S funders conditions. Now today, we're mainly talking about route two, which is publishing in subscription journals. And this includes journals that offer an open access option, um, what are often called hybrid journals, and that don't fall under an open access arrangement. Your library, if you're an academic, your library will help you with that. Now, Plan S principle one, um, that uh, Johan was talking about the principles earlier, Principle one states that um, authors or their institutions should retain the copyright of their publications and that those works should be published under an open license, preferably the Creative Commons attribution license called CC BY. Now, um, this 
uh, matter was very um, eloquently uh, described by Simon Baines from the University of Aberdeen as the best way to guarantee we can achieve open access to our research in all circumstances, and I think that in all circumstances is important, is to stop giving away our control over it, our meaning the authors and the institutions behind them. Thanks, Johan. So if we're thinking about copyright ownership, who owns the original copyright in the content of a researcher's research article? So it's pretty simple in as many jurisdictions as I'm aware of, the author does and the copyright protects that author's work and it's applied automatically. So an author doesn't have to sort of get some permission to have copyright of the material, it applies automatically. Now, if the author signs a license to publish their research article, then the author can control the use of that article. This information is from the UK Information Property Office, and it states, as a copyright owner, it's for you to decide whether and how you license your work. And if you do license it, like under a CC BY license, you can decide how your work is used. Thanks, Johan. But what actually happens in practice is that a publisher usually presents an author with a copyright transfer agreement or an exclusive license to publish for their signature. This might just be a click through signature or something like that. It includes the permission for the publisher to publish the work, which they legally need in order to be able to publish. But it also usually includes restrictions on how that author is allowed to use their own work. The author signs the agreement, and I made a little note here that many don't even read the agreement, and I know that from talking to people. And the end result of this is that the publisher has taken control of the rights to that work. And in both cases, both copyright transfer agreement and an exclusive license to publish, the publisher has grabbed all the author's rights even though, as you saw on the previous slide, the author as copyright holder and license grantor can control supposedly the use of their work. Now, we strongly believe that the author is and should remain the owner of the intellectual content of that article. I'll hand it over to Johan here. Yes, uh, thank you, Sally. Um, the rights retention strategy, therefore, is in fact based on a very simple principle, namely that the peer review, the author accepted manuscript, is the intellectual creation of the authors and belongs to them. And that the author, to assert ownership, they have to apply a CC BY license to the AM arising from this submission. This is very important because when you apply a CC BY license to a submission or to the AM arising from a submission, that license becomes inherent in the paper. It's not something that can be undone, so to speak. So this is very important. That's why we insist so much on it, that authors take uh, advantage of that right that they have to assert this license by license on a paper. We believe very strongly that, you know, uh, delivering publication services does not entitle publishers to own uh, the AAM or to own the paper. Uh, because it's not their intellectual property. Uh, we do believe that publication services should be paid for. Obviously, publication doesn't happen for free. There's a lot of work involved, which I very well know as an, as an editor, and that costs money. And uh, But but funders and universities and also individual researchers should ensure that researchers are not deprived of their essential uh, property rights, because, in fact, property rights are a, a valuable asset assets, as even the, the, the publishers would agree. But there is no reason in this day and age where we can pay for publication services to make to, to, also, um, to also hand over the, uh, the property rights to the articles. Um, so the main objective of the rights retention strategy is that all research is open access without the Marco and CC by license. Uh, we believe that ownership and control empower researchers working with a coalition as funder to retain these intellectual property rights to their author accepted manuscripts. 
It also means that as uh, that your paper uh, is globally accessible, authors who own the right to the AM can share it in a repository and in a repository it is available for everyone in the world to see. And uh, the important thing here is also that it cuts to the complexity of journal permissions. So not only uh, with the CC BY license do you not have to respect an embargo, but the CC BY license allows you to share that AAM with anyone via repository. And crucially, this is, I think, most, most important for authors, it allows an author to reuse their materials as they see fit. Um, this is particularly important because, for instance, you can you can you can keep your graphs, your tables, uh, your examples, your your pictures that you use in an article, and reuse them in later articles. Whereas before, without the CC BY license, you had to ask for permission. So we we compare this payment for services as opposed to the claim for ownership to. Uh, a decorator decorating your house. You, you know, when you pay a decorator to pay your house, they will strip the wallpapers and the woodwork, do an undercoat and so on. But you pay for services. You, in the same way, we pay for service for publication services. I mean, it's your paper, it's your house, so to speak. And of course, the publisher makes it makes it nicer and even does a certain inspection of your work, just in the way you would have your house inspected for uh, things. But that doesn't mean that you hand over after the decorator or the inspector has come to your house for work. It doesn't mean you offer the keys and you said, well, thank you for your services. Uh, you now own my house because you have so nicely painted it or inspected it. Uh, so when you see that analogy, I think, I think it's clear that there is no reason why we should hand over these uh, um, the, the property rights to the paper uh, in, in, in exchange for publication services. That is the way we want to see this. Uh, bottom line is that if you sign a copyright transfer agreement, your hands are tight. Uh, publishers have had no input to the intellectual content of the paper. They demand copyright transfer exclusive licenses, and they can do then with that work what they, what they want. And you have to ask them for permission back most of the time to reuse your own, your own the material in your, in your papers. Um, while in fact, the author is the intellectual creator and the copyright holder of the work, they are now severely limited to what you can do with your work. And you often have to beg the publisher for permission to reuse parts of your work. So we want to do away with all that. And the CC BY license is the way to do that. You assert ownership on your work and, you, and that allows you to share it freely and to reuse materials in it. So that I think is, is, is very important. Uh, so what authors need to do here is uh, it's very simple in our view, namely you need to inform the publisher that you use the rights retention strategy. And so we ask coalition as funded authors to include the following template and language in their submissions. First, that the research was funded by this funder. And then secondly, the most important sentence is actually that the CC BY license is applied to the AM arising from the submission in accordance with the grants open access condition. Now, of course, if you are not funded by a coalition as author, you can still use this language. Then you do simply do not mention that you have a funder, but that you do this out of your own volition or because your uh, university asks for it. That is another possibility. Maybe that your university has enacted or will enact uh, a, a rights retention uh, policy and we will talk about that a little bit later and in that case you you also have to assert a cc by license on the aam author accepted manuscript that arises from your submission so on publication this allows you to share the aam freely in a, in a repository and uh, you have to contact, of course, your funder in case of disagreement or obfuscation by the publisher. And we will come to, uh, back to that in, in a minute, the obfuscation by the publisher, that is. Um, for instance, what we have seen in the last year and a half since we have enacted the rights retention policy is, uh, on the one hand, publish it all, when we informed the publishers that we would um, enact this policy, we did not receive any uh, uh, any any uh, letters back saying we will not accept papers that uh, that are accompanied by a claim to uh, CC BY. Uh, there's only, uh, in fact, two journals that have explicitly said that uh, they uh, will not accept papers that come with such a license. That's uh, Blood Advances and another journal of the same of the same publishers. Two journals in the in the entire world that have informed us 
about this. Of course, we received publishers' uh, letters saying that they lament this rights retention strategy and this is what not, not a good idea, so we received complaints, but no one told us, uh, do not bother darkening our doors with your papers, right? That is not what happened. By contrast, what we did see was what we could, what we would like to call guerrilla warfare on uh, the part of the publishers. So um, authors were misinformed, and you see a couple of examples in, in here, for instance, saying you cannot use the RRS statement when submitting to the journal. Well, that is simply not true. Uh, you, you can. I mean, it's your right to do that. Uh, the only thing that the journal can do is, is to say, we will not accept your article. That That is fair game. Of course, a publisher is not obliged to publish your article or to consider it for, for publication. Uh, we, we agree on that. Uh, we also uh, saw statements like, before proceeding with your submission, you must agree to an APC for publication. Well, that is also not true. I mean, a CC BY license that is not uh, in intimately linked to the payment for the publication. Um, and you have to be careful because if you say yes to that, of course, you uh, enter a contractual agreement. If you agree to pay uh, some, then you agree to pay for it. Now, you, you, you may do that if you have the funds, but if you don't, uh, do be uh, do do consider that the CC BY license is completely independent of payment. There is absolutely no link between those two. And the most dangerous one is the one in which the publisher asks you to sign a separate contract to respect their embargo. So that means that you would sign an agreement with them under contract law, which is not the same as, as copyright law. And that would engage you indeed then to respect an embargo. But of course, if you sign a contract, that agrees to an embargo, then you will be in breach of your grant conditions. And that means that you breach the grant conditions with the funder and the funder could uh, hold you responsible for that uh, because the grant conditions clearly state that you should not have embargo on your published papers. Now, there is a question here whether this is uh, very akin to uh, procuring a breach of contract for the publishers are doing uh, here. And we are looking into that more about that at some later stage. Um, some publishers, therefore, are knowingly putting authors in a difficult situation. Uh, contracts can contradict the grant agreement, so be careful with that as an author. And um, sometimes we have even seen cases where the uh, the publishers suggest to the author that the RS language be deleted from the paper, which is amounts to a form of censor censorship. Uh, or would we call it copy editing? Um, and of course, the, the, the nasty thing from our perspective is that sometimes publishers will wait with this uh, additional contract until the end of the reviewing process when the paper is accepted and the author feels stuck, uh, so to speak. And this is something, of course, that, that, that should not be allowed. Uh, we believe very strongly that publishers have the right to desk reject paper with the right, rights retention strategy language, that's fine, but they should not mislead or confuse or trick authors into violating their grant agreement. And we have written a letter to 150 publishers asking them to be clear about these conditions. Um, uh, direction of travel that we see is, is encouraging though with the rights retention strategy. Um, uh, first of all, we have written this letter together with EUA and with César, uh, a letter to publishers uh, about a year ago. Uh, yeah. We did not receive a reply to that, but that was clear. But in, in any case, what you see is university associations like César and EUA, uh, university, uh, European University Association and Coalition S and Science Europe mm -hmm. coming together. So funders and universities coming together to tell the publishers, hey, wait a minute, this is not fair what you're doing. You are confusing our authors. This is not the way, uh, this is not what we expect of uh, a service provider because that is in fact what publisher are, publishers are. Um, we also see in the UNESCO recommendation on open science that uh, transfer licensing of copyrights to third parties should not restrict the right to immediate open access of a scientific publication. So this is really uh, what we are trying to do with Plan S, uh, although this it predates this clause. So it's really echoing, you see echoes of our rights retention strategy, of our policies in various important international documents these days. Uh, you also see it in the G6 statement on open science. Uh, uh, researchers cannot freely share the results if uh, they publish, if publishers hold copyright. 
we should uh, support researchers to retain sufficient rights. So you really see that a number of uh, stakeholders are now coming together around this idea that uh, authors should retain their rights, should retain sufficient rights in order to share the manuscript freely with the rest of the world. Um, same uh, with uh, the EUA uh, statement here that you see, uh, uh, the, which they, which uh, in, uh, European University Association uh, gone behind, and we uh, see, for instance, the, the the statement that here that research, universities, research performing organizations, and researchers and that libraries have a crucial role to play in regaining academic sovereignty over the publishing process, and that. Uh, Perness, uh, the intellectual property, property rights should be retained. Um, so, because that will allow us to create systemic change, as EUA uh, rightly uh, argues. Um, Council of Europe is also along with this in context of the French presidency at the beginning of this year. Uh, there was a draft ministerial position to adopt. Uh, uh, to for EU member governments' positions. We don't know yet what the outcome is of that. But in any case, that again asserts very strongly that the rights retention strategy should be used in order to retain intellectual property rights in line with our rights retention strategy. So you can really see that a number of actors are coming together here. Uh, and uh, um, and, uh, and are thinking in the same direction. Sally, I'm not sure if you take over from here. Yes, I take over here. We're going to take a look here at how academia is starting to take back control. Now, a colleague at uh, Birkbeck University of London said recently that rights retention specifically acknowledges not just the hard work, but the ownership of the expression of ideas by researchers. And this is why it's so important for institutions as well as funders to help authors to take back their rights and to retain those rights. In 2008, Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences voted unanimously, note be unanimously there, to give Harvard a non-exclusive irrevocable license to distribute their scholarly articles for any non-profit purpose. Um, it's a type of rights retention policy for the institution. So what took off at Harvard um, with its unanimously faculty approved permissions policy, permissions based policy, has spread. And you can see on the right there, I know it's too small, but it, it actually went, went even further. It's a list of institutions who've adopted similar policies to Harvard. Worth taking a look at that. Thanks, Johan. Here we see the, um, the Arctic University of Norway, and they published their new institutional rights retention policy, which came into effect from the 1st of January this year. And the policy includes a rights retention aspect. It actually says, for employees and students wishing to publish in academic publication channels that have subscription-based access, UIT's infrastructure for self-archiving shall ensure open access to the academic literature. Next slide, please, Johan. A similar step has been taken at the University of Edinburgh, and there they've got a, a similar rights retention policy <clears throat> where the university supports their um, researchers in taking control of, of the rights of the materials that they produce. Thanks, Johan. And we've even more recently seen the University of Cambridge launch its rights retention pilot. This is exactly in the same vein as that Edinburgh um, policy that I just show you. We're aware of many more universities also um, developing institutional rights retention policies. And it's really significant this, and it signals that researchers and their institutions have basically had enough of um, these critical rights to, to the, like the crown jewels of what their, their, um, the researchers are producing, being freely given away to their advantage, both the researchers and the institution's advantage. So thinking about what universities do in this Plan S Principle 1 vein um, to support their researchers in this space, um, first of all, uh, they can work 
uh, administrators and research support people can work closely with their libraries. You'll find a lot of experienced and knowledgeable staff in the libraries there. And they will help with matters of copyright and licensing. Um, some top publishers, as you've seen uh, from Johan, just this, this, these particular publishers who are trying to make things difficult for researchers, we, we're trying to say don't tolerate this, you know, you're, you're paying for a service. Um, try to push back against that um, because uh, you may need to involve the university's legal services offices here to get advice about what can and can't be done. Thirdly, um, try looking down the other end of the telescope here. Instead of focusing on compliance um, with externally imposed terms and conditions that people are being asked to sign, work with the legal services for advice on, on, on getting it from the author's perspective. You know, what do authors need to do in order to have control of their own work for the benefit of the author, not for the benefit of a publisher? So if not already in place, um, libraries and others can raise awareness of copyright and licensing with authors, but I know a lot of librarians are already doing this, but you know, can always do more. And finally, um, universities can adopt an institutional copyright and rights retention policy, like I've shown you from Edinburgh, Norway and Cambridge, similar to those and Harvard, um, to help your researchers retain the rights and those are more powerful than a funder's policy, so even more powerful than rights retention strategy. So we're going to um, finish by showing you some resources, first of all, um, to assist researchers and institutions and their support staff. We've made some resources available for anybody to use and you can find them on the website. There is a template of wording for authors to use to request clarity on the publisher's position regarding um, their submission about their rights. And this is for authors to use before they even submit. What, what um, Johan was saying earlier about, they often don't find out until the acceptance stage, which they've been through peer review, and you know it's more difficult to bail out at that point. So there's a, a template letter there, and that can be used and adapted as people wish. And if universities want to create their own version of that and put their own branding on it, that's absolutely fine. And if that's not used, there's a, a similar letter which can be used at the covering letter stage. So at the submission stage, asking for clarity from the publisher. Here's my paper. What are you doing about rights? You know, I'm going to use I'm going to retain my rights. Are you going to cause me a problem? I want to find out now before I get to the end of peer review. Thank you very much. There is a very nice video about rights retention, short and sweet. Take a little look at that. And there's a quiz. Uh, next slide, please, Johan. Um, some of you may have already attempted our little quiz. If you haven't, then uh, I can strongly recommend that you go along and uh, try that one out. Next slide. And here we'd like to announce that we have um, made a page aimed specifically at librarians, which have got information and links to resources about the rights retention strategy. There's a whole raft of stuff there, some available to download. Uh, there are, there's a slide deck there where, they, where you can cherry pick slides from it, adapt and use it, all under CC BY license <laughs> in the, the best possible practice. And, and we're welcome to further suggestions for anything that Coalition S can provide that will help librarians and their institutions support their staff. And also, we have produced some resources for research administrators. This is mainly around the Plan S 10 principles, and it gives uh, key themes that universities uh, may wish to be aware of, and then some suggestions for what universities might be able to do um, to support their, their researchers in, um, in making their work open access and in, in alignment with uh, Plan S principles and policies. And so I'll hand over to Johan for the take home messages. Yes, very briefly, uh, the take home me messages. Um, there are three basically, namely uh, article content belongs to the author for them to do with as they choose. And this is for the benefit of authors, institutions, and for society in general. Retain your rights 
so you can share your article and so you can reuse your material. Share your article is maybe the, the social aspect, but there is also a very selfish aspect in there, namely you can reuse your own materials. That's not the case right now. So, you know, help yourself to help others, so to speak. Uh, rights retention helps authors retain their rights, and it as, at the same time is a tool for compliance with the funder agreement. Uh, we believe that an institutional rights retention uh, strategy policy is even, even more powerful because there there's an empl a direct employer-employee relationship that, that, that reinforces that right uh, for the individual authors. And while uh, some publishers continue to, to deny authors rights and, and grab them for themselves, we believe that key stakeholders can correct this state of affairs and we've seen this. Uh, funders are working together with universities, uh, uh, but now it's up to authors to take that up uh, to, uh, to assert these rights for themselves, we believe, on the one hand, but also to convince their universities that adopting a rights retention policy at the university will strengthen them in the face of the publishers who are always a little bit intimidating for uh, an author. And I'll finish with a slide with um, uh, all the various links, but you can find that for yourself on our, on our website, which, is, uh, which can be easily navigated. And I thank you for your attention and we, we are now ready to, uh, to answer some questions. I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks a lot, Johan and Sally. That was excellent. Uh, and as you see, colleagues, uh, Zabra, very well phrased uh, key messages to explain what rights retention is. Uh, Zabra policy wording uh, templates already, which have been tested and proved and adopted by, by a number of universities. There are also resources, uh, available, reusable resources for researchers, librarians, research administrators. So there is a lot in place already. And um, I was wondering uh, what else would you need to, and that, that's, that's a question to our attendees today, uh, what else would you need uh, to advance rights retention strategy in your institutions and countries? Uh, and of course, it's a reminder that if, if you have any questions to your and Sally, please post them in a QA and a here, or you can also write in the chat if that's easier, or you can raise your hand and we'll let you speak. Uh, yes, and if the, if the question is, do you want, uh, we need you to speak to our university leadership, we are very willing to do so. So that's wonderful. <laughs> let's preemptive, preemptively answer that question. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, that's very, very good to know. I think what, one other thing to add, um, if there aren't any questions at the minute, is that, um, you know, we've been talking about journal articles here, but I think most, most of the attendees will be very aware of um, developments in open science and how, how, how um, researchers are putting their, their materials and findings out there is developing very quickly. I have just uh, saw this morning that Arcadia uh, fund has has produced something called Arcadia Publishing, and they're they're putting out uh, their findings of research as it happens. It's it's like the sort of um, the the difference between a record of version, you know, this sort of fixed idea of an article and something which is changing and and developing as the research develops. And I think the idea of rights retention is really important from the get go with, with a funder with um, a researcher's research so that anything that they put out there and it doesn't matter if it's a journal article or a preprint or a, or a micro publication or anything to keep the rights for everything so it sort of goes much broader than journal articles in this new open science world yes Yes, and the same goes for open access books. I mean, what I've noticed uh, even in my own field, for instance, is that many people are, co are convinced of, of, of open access for articles, but not yet about open access for books. Uh, now we have agreed on uh, with Coalition S on a slower timeline for books, but I, I do think everyone needs I think Johan's frozen. So we know from studies of the publishers themselves, for instance, in nature, that open access books are much more cited and much more available, uh, much more widely read than, uh, than closed books, uh, than traditional paper books. 
and we we should really think into, uh, about books as well because of course books still have some kind of an aura uh, uh, around them right i mean the physical book with a nice jacket like the ones behind me are still an, an object of prestige it's easy to give those to your to your mother for you know christmas uh, and the digital copy doesn't have quite that same cachet but we have we don't i mean your mother is not going to read your open access your your scientific book right i mean what you want to be able to do to do is make that book available for people who are reading your work in in south america in africa in indonesia that's where your audience where your real audience is so I'm really insisting on open access books there as well i see there is a question by vanessa in the yes there are actually two questions and i think they are related so one is from vanessa proudman from spark europe um, you mentioned publishers who are cooperating and others who are not are you monitoring this and uh, will you over time will you share some of this out and then another question in a chat from Alessandra, just wondering. Uh, yes, but we are not yet uh, ready to, 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 to share that also because, I mean, it's a little bit delicate to uh, name and shame, uh, uh, name and shame specific publishers. Um, but there are a number of publishers who, who accept this, for instance, in rights retention strategy. If you look at Sage and Emerald, for instance, they do allow you to share your article uh, on publication in, in a repository. Uh, other um, other publishers are much more reluctant and do, but for now we want to speak in more general terms uh, because we want to give the publishers uh, uh, some uh, the possibility to repent and <laughs> and to uh, to adapt their their, their policies. Uh, it's not yet. I mean, we are not. We we do not consider ourselves to be a policeman of the publishers. We just want to encourage good behavior. But right now, we are not yet uh, willing to share lists of, of compliant publishers. Sorry, Sally. Yeah, I was just going to say. I think one. I think the main problem is that we don't know in a way because um, it's a no response. So um, you know, it's not that they they have said they 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 won't. Some of them. Um, I think your, your point about sharing out those who, who do cooperate, the good practice, I think is, is a, a better way forward, because with, with many of the others, we just don't know, because, um, you know, you will have seen Ross Mounts has done some work looking at those people who and um, those papers that have been made freely available under the rights retention um, and the publisher has not kicked up a fuss. So I think a lot of publishers are staying silent, but um, some of them have have you know, are making it clear that they really don't like green open access, you know, and repository open access, and they really don't like um, uh, authors retaining their own rights. There's one particular large publisher who's, who's making a lot of noise about that. But nonetheless, there are still an awful lot of papers been made freely available um, with rights retention. Yes, I see, I see another question in the chat. What if any work is being done to negotiate RRS with publishers? Well, we, we, we tried. I mean, we tried via the OASPA blog. We tried by uh, addressing them directly with a letter to 150 publishers. First of all, in 2019, July 2019, when we informed the publishers that we would be applying this policy. And then uh, last year in June, I think it was May or June 2021, 20, when we informed the publishers that they really should cut out these antics of uh, confusing authors and that they should be clear about it. And we sent them another, le another letter a few months ago to which we received no, no response either. So our policy towards them is really this. We announce loud and clear, look, rights retention is here to stay. We are going to take it back. Uh, we're going to do, take it back together with universities. So you better adapt to this um, and stop confusing our authors or they will go elsewhere. That is also a possibility, right? I mean, authors who will be confronted with this kind of confusion next time around will go to a more compliant uh, publisher. Uh, in, in that sense, it's perhaps a good idea Those who do, do fully cooperate and state so explicitly. Uh, but we would have to look into that uh, into that possibility because, as Sally said, it's very hard to know who does and who doesn't. I mean, mostly the answer is, oh, uh, uh, rights retention strategy will be the end of publishing as we know it. Um, basically, what you have to read is the end of profits as we know it, but that's that's a different issue. Um, 
but 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 that in itself does not refuse the rights retention strategy is basically a criticism of our policies so that not quite the same so it's very difficult to get a good read of the situation there but should be um advocating the, the best way to advocate is to a great number of researchers is yes to talk to researchers uh you know librarians talking to their researchers university administrators talking to their researchers uh that's also why we launched the rights retention campaign uh you know in a rather playful manner with these various uh uh various little templates and the the the, the, the quiz and the, the the little movie so we hope that a lot of researchers will see this um so if you see in your own organization a way of disseminating this more broadly amongst researchers please please do so by any means possible there is also a comment in a chat from alessandra just wondering is something like chef baromeo on the horizon for rights retention strategy or is it part of your journal check at all development or? we're not creating a, a special a special platform for rights retention strategy like Sherpa Romeo. Um, I mean, the journal checker tool is the way um, Coalition S is um, trying to make things clear for, for researchers what options are open to them. Yes. I, I think this, um, you know, th this goes beyond, co you know, Coalition S can do can do things for the Coalition S funders, but to do something for everybody is much more difficult. Sherpa Romeo um, is aimed at everybody in the whole world. So yeah. um, I think uh, that that would not be something Coalition S would, would consider for this. But I think, you know, it, the rights retention strategy, as Johan has been saying, is also for everybody in the whole world. You know, the, the funders can only can only change things within their remit, can only change things for their, their grantees. But um, but the um, everybody in the world, because, you know, you're thinking about uh, gold open access and all the the um, the uh, deals that are being done um, in some countries, the sort of read and publish deals. Well, you know, OK, so those those researchers are fine, but then there are people who don't who don't have read and publish deals, and it's important for them that they, they can also use this type of um, this type of uh, uh, tool in order to keep their rights, so that they can get their work open access as well. So it's it's a sort of very um, leveling strategy, I think, even though it's aimed specifically from our perspective at Coalition S fund fundees. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And there is a very nice thank you message in the chat. Uh, thanks for that. Yes. Thank you, Antonia. So I think um, it's it's been made a little bit more clear what, what the current uh, rights retention developments are, at least in Europe, uh, as it was stressed. Uh, it could be implemented not only in the coalition as member institutions, but also all over the world. And uh, we are Seifel, and as you heard, Coalition S as well, are happy to assist uh, your I universities think that or your is, countries. Yes. I, 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 indeed, I think that is a very important take home message for, for, for people to, to realize, namely that they can, this is a policy that they can implement in their own university, irrespective of Coalition S. And it gives the university and their researchers an enormous amount of power in retaining the rights, in being able to share on any repository, and being and in be, being able to retain uh, the fruit of their labor, so to speak. Thank you so much for spending this morning um, afternoon with us, sir. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, Use today's resources. Uh, I'll, I'll share them with everyone. Now. And um, if you still have questions or suggestions, uh, we could stay for for another minute here if needed. And if not, uh, thank you so so much, Johan and Sally, for all your work and uh, for producing um, all these resources. As you see, they are very useful to people. Uh, they really make things much more clear. And they take away the burden for, from librarians to come up with uh, 
plain English language and also clear English, uh, clear legal language explanations. So that, thanks a lot for that, sir. Um, and thank you everyone for attending today and for sharing your questions and thoughts, sir. And I hope uh, we'll continue this conversation. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us, Irina. Very important for us. Thank you, Irina, and for everyone for attending. <laughs>